Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 5. So grab your Bible, open it up to the book of Romans chapter 5. And I'll give you a minute to do that. Meanwhile, I will tell you about the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. If you love the Word of God, check out thebibleversebyverse.com because as the name implies, as the web address applies, it's all about the Bible. That's all you're going to find there. That's all I've been doing is teaching the Bible verse by verse for over 30 years now. And I've gone through the Bible three times in its entirety, verse by verse, from Genesis through Revelation, and it's all there for you at thebibleversebyverse.com. So, if you are hungry for the Word of God, check it out at thebibleversebyverse.com and begin a verse-by-verse study through the whole Bible using my audio Bible commentaries. If you don't have a hunger for the Word of God, I encourage you all the more to go to thebibleversebyverse.com because once you start studying it, If you've got a heart for Jesus, your appetite for God's word is just going to be whetted. I mean, it's just a little appetizer. Just get a little taste. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. So check it out and begin a verse-by-verse study through the Bible one more time at thebibleversebyverse.com. Now let's pray. And Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. And I think we got through verse 16 of Romans chapter 5 last time. But to be honest with you, I don't think I did a very good job. This is such an important section. I want to go back a few verses and begin this section of Romans chapter 5 again. So let's begin, I would say... Let's begin in verse 10. For if when we were enemies, and I mentioned last time that sin is a declaration of war against God. And the Bible teaches, like it does right here, that sinners are God's enemies. So it says, for if when we were enemies, We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So, if Jesus loved you so much, in spite of your great unworthiness as his enemy, that he died for you, and when you received him as Lord and Savior, he forgave you all of your sins. If he was willing to do that for you, by his death when you were his enemy. Just think how much more he must be willing to forgive you, humanly speaking, now that you're his child because of your faith in Jesus Christ. So, as I said last time, never hesitate to confess your sin to God as a Christian, okay? Feel bad about your sin? Absolutely. But don't let your bad feelings keep you from confessing. That's what Satan wants. That's not what God wants. And not only so, verse 11, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by, here it is, watch this. Wherefore, as by one man, that one man being Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. All have sinned. And what he is talking about here is that we all have sinned in Adam. When Adam sinned, sin came into the entire human race. Because we were all in Adam. We all share that original sin. When Adam sinned, the entire human race 
all people who would ever live were infected with that sin. Sin entered and spread separation from God and eventual physical death to everyone. That's why everybody dies. So look at verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. From the time of Adam until the time that God gave Moses the law on Mount Sinai, a couple of thousand years at least, men and women did things that were wrong. They had a sin nature. They sinned. But they did not transgress. Because in order to transgress the law of God, you have to have the law of God. People committed sin from the time of Adam until God gave Moses the law. But during that time, now watch this. During that interval, God did not judge people guilty and worthy of death because of their personal sins. Why? Because God had not yet given his laws to people or told them what he wanted them to do. Verse 13 and 14. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. God didn't give the law until a couple of thousand years later when he gave it to Moses. Book of Exodus. So you had mankind from the time of Adam and Eve to the time that God gave the law to Moses committing sin, doing things that were wrong, but not violating the law. So when people died during that interval from Adam to Moses, it wasn't because of their own sin. They had no law from God, so God did not consider them worthy of death for the wrong that they had done because they did not violate the law. People died not because of the things that they did wrong because they didn't, they didn't violate the law, see? But people still die. You say, well, then why did people die if they didn't violate the law because there was no law? Then we're going to get right to the heart of the issue here. People died because they inherited that sin and the guilt of the sin that Adam committed, which was very direct disobedience to a specific command from God, don't eat from that tree. He transgressed. He broke the only law that God gave him. And we are in Adam, so we had that sin passed down to us. Adam died because of that transgression. We died because we inherit that transgression between the time of Adam and Eve and the law of Moses. And this is going to become clear in verse 15. Well, actually, yeah, verse 15. Well, let's read 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him that was to come. So none of us, I'll say us, None of the people who live between Adam and Eve and the law given to Moses on Mount Sinai ever violated personally themselves that law that you can't eat fruit from that tree, right? I mean, that was a one law given to one man who transgressed by not keeping it, which is why he died. So why does man die between the time of Adam and Eve and the remaining laws that God gave a couple thousand years later. Why did man die then? Because they shared in that transgression 
of their father Adam and in the guilt. It was handed down to them from their father. So, now with that, look at verse 14. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, Adam, many be dead, the rest of mankind, watch this, much more the grace of God and the gift of by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So here it is in a nutshell. One man, Adam, brought death to many by his one sin. One man, Jesus, brought forgiveness to many through God's mercy and through his death on the cross. One man's act of disobedience brought death to many. One man's act of obedience going to the cross brought life and forgiveness and mercy to many. The sinless life of Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death on the cross reverses the death sentence that came to man through Adam. It cancels it, and it reverses it. The obedience and the death of Jesus Christ gives eternal life to everyone who repents and receives him as Lord and Savior, completely undo undoes, undoes, and completely reverses. How's that? It completely reverses the negative effect that Adam said had, the hum had on the human race. Completely reverses it. Now verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. So it's a complete reversal. Adam's one sin brought the death penalty to many. Jesus removes many sins and brings spiritual life to many. So, again... Jesus undid all the bad that Adam did. Jesus undid all the bad that Adam did for those who become Christians. Not for the whole world. Potentially for the whole world. But only for the Christians who take advantage of what Jesus did. When a person becomes a follower of Jesus Christ, when they repent of their sin and ask Jesus Christ to come into their life to be their Lord and Savior... Jesus Christ, God, removes the sin of Adam and all their personal sins as well. So the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on the cross to pay for our sins completely wipes out not only that original sin and its guilt, but all of our personal sins as well. So what Adam did in a negative way, Jesus undid by dying on the cross. See, do you see why the Bible says there is salvation in no one else? There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. Do you see why? Because it was one man who sinned, and it was one man who eliminated that sin, and that man is Jesus Christ. That's why there's salvation found in no one else except Jesus. And that's why you have to receive him as Lord and Savior, or what he did for you, it's not going to do you any good. Verse 17, he continues, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. God's mercy and his grace are more powerful than Adam's original sin and all of our sins together. God's mercy and his grace, which was purchased for us through the blood of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross, God's mercy and grace are more powerful than Adam's original sin and all of our sins combined. 
That's why when a person receives Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the grace of God completely removes the guilt and the stain of that sin. Because the blood of Jesus Christ shed for sin is much more powerful than our sin or Adam's original sin. And all of them put together. Just wipes it out. Completely. Verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. The sin of Adam brought guilt and judgment to everyone. The sin of Adam brought guilt and judgment to everyone. The death of Jesus Christ on the cross takes away all the guilt and the punishment for those who receive him as Lord and Savior. Jesus has done all that needed to be done to make guilty sinners right with God. Nothing else needs to be done. He did it all. It was more than enough. He undid the sin problem caused by Adam's original sin and all of our personal sin. He undid it all. Verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Adam caused many to be made sinners because of his disobedience. The obedience of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross caused many to be righteous in the sight of God. Cleaned it all up. Just like that. Isn't that nice? Don't we owe everything to Jesus Christ? Well, you better believe it. That's why, don't tell me that Jesus isn't sufficient. Don't tell me that. Because you'll hear an earful. And don't tell me there's another way to heaven besides Jesus Christ. And if you say that and you're a Hindu, if you say that and you're a Muslim, if you say that and you're a poor, pathetic atheist, you know what? I cut you some slack because, because you don't know any better. But if you call yourself a Christian and you're one of these open-minded, liberal-minded, modern evangelicals who suggest that there are other ways to heaven beyond Jesus Christ, you are going to hear an earful from me. Not that it matters to you. You're still going to hear it. Moreover, verse 20, the law entered that the offense might abound. Stop there. God gave the commandments. This is what this means. God gave the commandments. Not that, not that our sins would abound. Not that we would sin more. Oh, I think I'm going to give, I think I'm going to give the world the commandments. That way they'll sin more. No, 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 no. God gave, gave the commandments in order to show us how sinful we are that they would abound in our minds, that, we, that our knowledge of our sin would abound. So God gave the commandments, his standard of right and wrong, in order to show us just how sinful we are. God gave his law so that we would recognize that we are guilty and consequently condemned. Verse 20 again. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. This is one of the best verses in all of the Bible. I pray this every morning. Lord, the only hope I have after I confess my sins and I, and I confess the fact that my sins are too many to number, too many to count, and my horrible guilt, I always say my only hope, Lord God, is that your word says, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. God's grace is more powerful than the sum total of our sins. If your sins could be measured on judgment day and found to weigh 100 pounds, God would give you 101 pounds of mercy so that your sins will not be an issue. Jesus has more mercy than you have sinned. Jesus has more forgiveness than you have sin. 
you may have committed 10,000 pounds worth of sin. God will give you 10,001 pounds of forgiveness if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He always has more grace and mercy and forgiveness than you have sin. That's why the worst sinner, who Paul said was him, Paul, the Apostle Paul, you can't be the worst sinner in the world, you know that? You may think you are, but you're not, because Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, already told us that he was the, the worst sinner of all. And God forgave him. And Paul knew why he forgave him, too, for a lot of reasons. But one was so that you would know that you could be forgiven. He's already forgiven somebody worse than you. You say, but you don't know I've committed murder. So did Paul. Yeah, but I've done a lot of bad things to good people. So did Paul. He murdered Christians. He persecuted Jesus. He hated Jesus' guts. He hated the guts of Christians. He tried to stamp out the church. He tried to stop the message of salvation from being proclaimed. And he was forgiven. Take my word for it. Take God's word for it. Doesn't matter how bad you've been. God has more grace than you have bad. Verse 21. And it says, That as sin hath en- excuse me, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Adam's sin brings physical death, spiritual death, which is separation from God, eternal death, which is eternal separation from God in hell. Adam got the ball rolling. He not only gave us the guilt of that sin that he committed, he also passed on to us the sin nature, which is why we all sin personally. Thank you very much, Adam. But Adam's sin, in essence, brings eternal hell to mankind. Jesus' death brings eternal life to all who repent and receive him as Lord and Savior. Chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, in other words, should we keep sinning since God is so willing to forgive? Should we just sin and not care? That way we can showcase God's forgiveness. God has the answer to that question. Verse 2. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? No. Absolutely not. A real Christian doesn't continue to sin with no regrets and no desire to change. A real Christian hates their sin. Verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized unto Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. In other words, why should a Christian keep sinning when they don't have to do that? Answer, they shouldn't. Because since, because since power to enslave us from our, from our will has been, let me, say, let me put it this way. I'm becoming tongue-tied. Let me read verse 3 again. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. In other words, why should a Christian keep sinning when they don't have to do that? Why would a Christian keep sinning when the Holy Spirit is in them? And First John says, you can't. Not if the Holy Spirit's inside of you. So you won't if you're a real Christian, but why would you when you don't even have to and when you don't want to because the Holy Spirit's inside of you? And the answer is, you shouldn't keep sinning. You should not. Since sin's power to enslave us, apart from our will, has been broken in Christ. You, as a Christian, are now free not to sin, and you, as a Christian, inherently don't want to sin. Oh, there might be something in your flesh that still wants to do it. But deep down, below, even deeper, at a deeper level than, than that 
sinful nature of yours is the Holy Spirit who is working on you, creating in you a desire to be holy. So you deep down in your deep, the deepest recesses of your soul and spirit, you don't want to sin. And God has set you free from the power of sin. So why should you? It doesn't even make sense. Verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Jesus lives inside of Christians through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus lives inside of you if you are a Christian. Jesus lives inside of you if you are a Christian, and he does two things inside of you, okay? If you're a genuine Christian, Jesus, who's inside of you, does these two things. He gives you the desire not to sin. If you have no desire to abstain from sin, you don't have the Spirit of God in you, and you're not saved. You're just kidding yourself. You might be religious. You might have been confirmed. You might have been baptized. You might go to communion. You're not saved. If you don't have a desire to not sin at that deeper level than even your fleshly desires to, to sin, if there isn't something deeper down inside of you that doesn't want to sin, you're not saved. Because Jesus does that. He produces, he gives the Christian a desire not to sin, and he gives you the power not to sin. And it's true that we still have a sin nature that wants to sin. That's why we can still be tempted as Christians. But there's a deeper spiritual part of us that despises sin. And if you're a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not a Christian, you don't get it, and I can't explain it. It's something you've got to experience by receiving Christ, okay? But Jesus gives us the desire to do what is right and the power to do what is right in spite of our sin nature's desire to do what is wrong. Verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall, all, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Since Jesus died and paid for our sins, we who have received him as Lord and Savior will be raised from the dead just as he was. And with the same kind of physical, sinless, perfect, in every way, resurrected, resurrected body that Jesus had. And you know what? I think this is a pretty good place to stop for today. We'll pick it up in Romans chapter 6, verse 6 next time. While I have a minute, though, I will remind you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And I mentioned it at the beginning of the broadcast that if you want to study the Word of God, it's so simple. Just go to thebibleversebyverse.com. And if you're a first-time visitor, click on the book of Genesis, I would suggest, and click on chapter 1 and begin in the very beginning and go all the way through the Bible verse by verse, listening to my audio Bible commentaries. All you got to do is open up your Bible and follow along and listen. It'll bless you because it's the Word of God. If you go on a spiritual adventure that can't be matched by anything else in this world because it's the Word of God. And boy, you're going to get to know Jesus and you're going to draw closer to Jesus than you ever thought possible by the time you get through studying the Word of God all the way through. And I'll tell you something else. The cults and the false teachers are going to real, really have a hard time um, deceiving you. So do it, would you? At the BibleVerseByVerse.com. And if the Word of God is a blessing to you, please remember that I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. For 30 years, this has been a faith ministry, which means I depend on individuals like you to support this ministry and to keep it going. And you can give in a secure method at thebibleversebyverse.com while you're studying the Word of God. Take a break, click on the donate button at the top of the front page and give as the Lord may lead. Or you can write scripture verse by verse, post office box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, 53074. That's scripture verse by verse, post office box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, zip code 530. Seven, four. Until next time, so long, everyone.